You know, 10 years from now, what technology trends will prevail is an interesting question. Uh, you know, if anybody can predict 10 years from now, I, I'd like to meet them in Vegas. But I guess the, the key points here are, we have, a, we have a challenge across the globe where we have more patients and less physicians. That's a big challenge. And I think one of the ones that is going to continue is how do we ha maintain that interface between the physician and the patient, but not lose the intimacy of really what is that relationship. And that's gonna be digital medicine. You know, if you think of a practitioner's office today, what I see is three types of patients. I call it the red, yellow, green patient. You have a patient sitting in that waiting room that is an immediate need. And more times out of not, that physician sees that patient and can refer quickly. You then have the patient who I say is green. That patient doesn't need to be in there because really they're just coming back for a recurring visit where we could use telemedicine, where we could use other ways to be able to communicate without that patient having to occupy a space in the waiting room, increasing costs. Where we really need to spend time is what I call the patient that is yellow. Needs to be diagnosed, needs to spend more time with the physician. But because we're inundated with patients in an office in an inefficient mode, that doctor doesn't have that intimacy anymore. That doctor doesn't have the time with the patient. So I think one of the critical trends will be that patient not having to be every day in the doctor's office by using proper telemedicine. And then I think the next big trend is precision medicine. The ability to really identify and predict what that patient has by, ma by masses of data being utilized to understand. Case in point, a 35-year-old male comes in with a certain type of disease. There have been other 35-year-old males with a similar disease across the globe and been able to understand what happens with that patient, that disease. So we don't treat that patient as a singular option. We treat that patient based on predictive indications that the doctor now has at his or her hands with information. So in summary, we must make that physician much more informed, much better in understanding what to do with the patient that he or she is unsure of, and reduce the waste of excess time with a patient that doesn't need to be in that office. You know, one of the more challenging questions I get is, how do we develop ethical technology? Well, I want to first and say that the patient still owns his or her data today and in the future. It is the patient's data. It is no one else's data. However, we are able to mask that information better and better, and we must continue to mask it, but we must learn from it. The amount of incorrect diagnosis, the amount of incorrect deaths across the globe must stop. It has to stop. And we can stop it by being able to understand and be much more predictive by using patient's data. It doesn't mean that we're interfering with the intimacy of the doctor and the patient. It doesn't mean we're taking away from the patient his or her identity. But what we must do in order to properly diagnose is to learn from that patient. So it's not an ethical challenge. It's a challenge of what we do with the data correctly to help many people across the globe. Data is power. If it's used properly and respectfully, it can help us reduce the cost of healthcare, be able to get access to greater patients across and treat the patients correctly. The ethical matter is how to do it properly, not should we do it. Now, the question of why we should be an entrepreneur now, I'm going to deal with healthcare. That's my specialty. You know, if you look at all the great technologies, it started with one thought. It started with one person and one passion. If you look at a lot of the great companies today, it started with one person with one passion. We must continue to have people try new innovative ways. We also must have people fail. It's an interesting term, but I have heard that there are more successes that have been built from failures than successes that never had a failure before. 
And who is best at doing that? That's an entrepreneur. You know, I live today with an entrepreneur and, and our great chairman here at Avellino, Gene Lee. Gene has built an unbelievable company by having the identity to what we need to do from a gene therapy standpoint, by building on information and making sure that we're learning from that information. But it started with somebody having a passion. Now, people are challenged today in the economic crisis, can an entrepreneur continue to survive? I say actually an entrepreneur is ability to thrive now because independent ideas are far better than ideas that have been slowed down by a multiple of personas. So that entrepreneur is critical. The other thing that I like to say is you can take an entrepreneur and use an entrepreneurial attitude. What I mean by that is take an innovative idea and even though you work for a large company, become an entrepreneur in your company. Work for a large company. Don't worry about who's going to pay the light bill, but treat the company, treat it as if it was your own company and build an idea inside. So I don't mind if it's an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, but healthcare is going to continue to be built on one person who has a passion, who's probably failed along the way, learn from those mistakes, and continue to persevere. I'll take a side note. I worked for a company called Allergan. There was a product called Botox. Botox was first indicated for blepharospasms a very small indication. It was nearly cascaded away because the indication was small. But there was an individual in the company who saw the opportunity to take botulinum toxin and expand it beyond what its first indication was. Is that person an entrepreneur working within a large company? I would say that person is an entrepreneur who took an idea, worked within a company, and built it. So in summary, entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs need to exist today because the only way to continue to advance ideas is by somebody having a passion around that idea. Diversity, why we need it, how can we do it? Well, you know, that's a big, big question because diversity has many meanings. Let's first start with diversity of thought. Diversity of thought meaning you bring a bunch of people together and allow them to create not having the same thought. Positive conflict creates diversity of thought. The next is diversity of language, diversity of cultures. That is critical. This world is small. In to, you know, today's vantage, when you pull up your Google, you can get information across the globe. That's diversity of thought. That's diversity of culture. I had an opportunity to live overseas for 14 years. The term I hate is Europe. There is no such place as Europe. If you go to Spain, it is much different than France, which is much different than German, Germany, which is much different than the UK. So the diversity of that thought has led to tremendous ideas, tremendous leadership across. So diversity of thought, diversity of culture, diversity of language. But then the overarching way that people think about diversity is how we're gender, sex. Again, I say that diversity is critical because it brings back my first point. Everybody has a different opinion. Everybody can bring a different thought to a company. I read a book once about the best leading companies and why people invest in these leading companies. And one person said, Jack Welch, said he would never invest in a company if he walked into the boardroom and saw everybody agreeing. That's diversity of thought meaning he wanted to see challenging environments. And the only way you get a challenging environment is by diversity. And that is what is needed, and that's what makes progress in great companies.